debate. Are we spending enough on defence or are we spending too much considering the apparent lack of any military threat? Just take one area, some four and a half billion dollars to equip the Air Force with those new American F-18 fighters. You might well ask, what in heaven could be worth that kind of money? We thought we'd put that question directly to the men of 3 Squadron at Williamtown, north of Sydney, and let them answer it the way they know best. This sort of plane allows us to do the things that we've been practicing and attempting to do for many years far, far more effectively. It's really stunning in its performance. $30 million a piece. At that price, the Australian taxpayer might well expect a stunning performance. The F-18, our frontline fighter for the next 20 years. According to the pilots who fly her, we're getting our money's worth from the aeroplane that was christened the Hornet. Not so much that it looks like a Hornet, but it's appropriate from the sense that it has uh, a vicious sting, if you like. A vicious sting? A vicious sting. How vicious? It's the most potent tactical fighter in the world today, without any exception at all. Wing Commander Bruce Mowat. Like a man with a new car, he's King Kid on the block, the first Australian airman to command a fighting squadron of Hornets. Is it like catching up on the rest of the world? It's like catching up and overtaking the rest of the world. A demonstration of singleness of critical importance that we get our bombs on target, on time. The best in the world? Well, today, they'll have to put their money where their mouth is. We've been allowed in to this special briefing. The team is as listed. Baron Cougar is our call sign. Uh, the configuration, I'll be carrying eight Mark 82s on VERS. Just two men, Wing Commander Mowat and his 2IC squadron leader Ross Fox. Their mission, to take the Hornet through its first true field test, a bombing display before the top brass of the armed forces. In 10 seconds, it will be four, seven. Five, four, three, two, one. Hack, 4-7. Let's go. It's like opening night before a very critical audience. A lot of questions will be asked if the Air Force's expensive new toy fails to live up to its claims. Dropping real bombs right where they want it. That's the test, and that's exactly what the Hornets do. For these fighter pilots, it's a make-believe world of war games. But everything about it, their training, their planes, the money we spend on them, is based on the possibility of one day going to war. So do they ever feel frustrated knowing their skills may never be used? No, because war means death, really, and, and we live with death. Uh, it's a high-risk job as well. We've all lost friends who've been killed in, in aircraft accidents. Um, so we, we're very familiar with death. We don't, war is not something we aspire to. Is there ever a, ever a twinge there, ever a hope that one day you will fly in a battle? There's often a twinge in the sense that you think about what, how, how you'd react uh, in that ultimate situation, but there's never any hope that it will happen, that's for sure. There's no desire in you to go to war? Not at all. Today's program, first up will be Baron Raider, will be Mutt and Purse. Second wave will be Baron Cougar, that'll be JP, you'll be leading, and Mal. And as I said, play it cool today on all these missions. As they say, they don't want war, but every day the men of 3 Squadron train and talk as though it could break out tomorrow. If you're defensive, use every trick you can to stay alive. So everything you can think of, every last ditch manoeuvre you have in your little bag of tricks, try it and just prevent the guy from shooting you until he runs out of fuel. Could you kill another pilot if you had to? If he was the enemy pilot, I could... Uh, provided I could believe in what I was doing, 
in the war that I was involved in, I could do that, yes. That's what I'm training for. We are the first line of defence, if you like. If someone attacks Australia, the fighters are the first line of defence. So someone attacking Australia, I would blast them out of the sky. Some of us have seen some of the consequences of war firsthand. We have no illusions as to the horror of war, and therefore we believe more fervently, feel far more fervently, in trying to avoid it than perhaps most other Australians would. Don't press any closer than a mile and a half trying to get a front aspect missile shot, otherwise you're likely to collide. Fox 2. Fox 2 up the guy going vertically up at 25,000. We try and make it harder than we'd ever expect it to be in wartime. So that if we have to go to war with all the additional stresses of, of enemy shooting back at you, etc., then we'd be able to cope with it. Fox 2, kill on the banner. Reverse! Copy it! Now, now coming no time. And it's extending on south. Up here, it's got to be as close to combat as they can get without killing themselves in the process. There are risks in any game. Uh, you know, I could get run over by a bus going to work tomorrow. Flight Lieutenant Tracy McCormack, or to his mates, T-Mac. He knows how risky these war games can be. He survived a mid-air collision in a Mirage, one of our older fighters. We hit head on, uh, but his, his wingtip came past my tail. Uh, I took a couple of inches off his wingtip and he took a couple of inches off my tail. Uh, so basically, it you know, missed the important part of the aeroplane, so we were both able to fly home. That would have to be about as close to death as any pilot could ever come, surely? Yeah, it was, it was pretty close. The, uh, we've calculated after the event that his wingtip missed the canopy where I was sitting uh, by about four inches. And the closing speed at the time was something over 2,000 kilometres an hour. Do you think about that, that uh, you could be killed yes. when you're flying a mission? Yes, yes. It, it's a great incentive to concentrate, I can tell you. <laughs> crash on the ground on the ground the flight and simulator yeah. yes. one way of minimizing the risk of losing a pilot's life and one of those 30 million dollar airplanes yeah. how, cl how close to the real thing is it it's an exact exact copy of the real thing the only thing it doesn't replicate are the forces on your body now, hornet now pilots here, use it to polish their skills for some others the chance to live out a boyhood dream the taking to the skies in a jet fighter while sitting safely on the here. ground now check it forward with the stick check forward Push forward. How am I doing? You're going well now. The Just flight simulator will let you fly the Hornet anywhere in the world. You can even land at Sydney Airport. Well, in a fashion. OK, Ian, here we are lined up in Sydney Airport at Mascot. So we've just passed Centre Point Tower and the Harbour Bridge out to the left there. We You've missed, got it. We missed, we them, missed anyway. them There you go. Press the button. Press the button for automatic throttle control. There you go. Now, just gentle, gentle corrections on the control column now. Right. Too high. Don't worry about it, just gent gentle corrections. We've got the whole runway to land on. 200 feet. Hold that attitude. We're going to make it. Push forward, push forward. We'll run out of runway otherwise. That'll do. Hold it there. We made it. Close the throttle, we'll get airborne again. We're yeah, airborne we, again. We, we airborne? <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're up again. We're up again. And we're about to die here. <laughs> we're about to die. <laughs> We've just got into the harbour. How long do I have to live? <laughs> have two seconds. That's it. <laughs> oh, we're dead. That's, that's tighter. They always as tight as this. They are, Ian. That, that's your G-suit, that uncomfortable suit you're wearing. It's, uh, it's there to stop you blacking out under high G. It stops all the blood pooling in the lower half of your body. It's high fashion. <laughs> now, for the real thing. But first, you have to dress for the part. What's this do? It's now, this contains your May West, which uh, inflates when you enter the water if we have to eject. The more you put on, the more you realise that what goes up may not always come down the way you want it to. We're about to fly in one of the most efficient killing machines money can buy. The Hornet. The state of the art. Every fighter pilot would certainly like to fly a Hornet. Uh, it's an exciting aeroplane, a very exciting aeroplane. It is the most unbelievable fighter that we have ever had. Tight fit. Yeah. There's a Hornet here. Oh, 
that is neat. It's a very tight fit, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> this is the ejection handle here. Now, if things turn to worms in the air, we have to get out quickly. You grab that handle with the right hand, grab your left wrist around, your left hand around your right wrist and pull firmly, putting your head back at the same time. That's the normal like ejection this. posture. Okay, yeah. this, this is the bowyang that goes around the thigh. Mm -hmm. And it stops your legs from flailing. It goes under your, around your thighs, so... Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what happens if my legs are flaying? If these didn't work on ejection, your legs yeah. would flail and you'd, you'd break your pelvis. Full of good news, Ross. So far, no one here has had to pull that handle in a Hornet. But there are pilots in 3 Squadron who know what it's like to leave a jet in mid-air. It really all happens pretty quickly uh, from the time you pull the handle uh, till the time you're left hanging in a parachute. Remember T-Mac, the pilot who survived a mid-air collision? Well, that wasn't his only close call. He once had to eject from a Mirage when its wheels wouldn't go down. You couldn't try to land the aeroplane wheels up, save the aeroplane? Well, it lands at 350 kilometres an hour. Uh, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't like to drive a car at 350 kilometres an hour without wheels on it. Ejection select should be on normal. Ever had to do that, eject? I've never had to, Ian, no. If we, if we have an engine fire or engine failure after we get airborne, we'll continue with the takeoff. If we can't fly, we'll eject, and I'll call Ian, eject, eject, eject. OK, that should be a good ride. <laughs> OK, we're ready to go. All set, we'll go. All set. OK. Releasing the brakes. Opening the throttle. Here we go, we've got power, light the burners, and just feel that kick. Oh, off, off we go. You must accept the possibility that one day you're going to lose a Hornet, an F-18 is going to crash. Do you think much about that? Statistically, it's going to happen at some stage. You know, it's, it's, it's a fact of life. Uh, a hard ground and a soft sky, it, people will make mistakes. Mistakes will happen. It's a human world. So we will lose an aeroplane. As it's turned out, we've lost eight fighter pilots in the past ten years. Cold statistics for the Air Force. 
but something that haunts an Air Force wife like Vicky Fox. When a plane goes missing, when you hear of a, of a jet crashing, how do you react to that? Well, I instantly worry that it's Ross until I hear about it. And uh, you just have to wait till somebody comes to tell you or else you hear on the news that it's not him. Or if it was him, the chaplain or someone would come and tell me it was him. Do you rush to the phone and ring the base? No, you can't get through, so you just have to wait. It's probably safer than driving on the road, if you look at it statistically. Safer than driving. But then Ross Fox has wanted to fly since he was a little boy, about the age his own sons are now. What about your sons? If they showed that they might like to fly, would you, would you be happy with that? Yes, I would be. I mean, um, as Ross says, a lot of our friends have been killed, but you just hope that it's not your family that is going to be involved. How good a fighter pilot do you think your husband is? the best. <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> he thought about 5G, being a student, went wop. He got a compressor stall and I flamed out following him. <laughs> if you could ever tune in to what they're saying, you'd find they're talking about disasters missed by fractions of a second. Maximum G straight into you. High G roll, that's all you're Maximum talking G. about. Keep, keep Max high G roll. Bright, adventurous young men gambling their lives on a reflex, living constantly with the risk of death and laughing it off. He started this half roll and pull through after four weeks leave up in Butterworth and he, and he blacked out when he was vertically down and he had a look, God, I'm going to die. So he just puts both feet on the instrument panel, pulls like hell, pulls 11G in the aeroplane, blacks out, recovers by 5,000 feet. <laughs> Too much. Yeah. The world of the fighter pilot, a blend of raw youth and cautious experience. Newcomers in their early 20s and veterans approaching 40. What happens to old fighter pilots? Old fighter pilots, uh, if they stay in the Air Force, that is, uh, will end up behind a desk. Flying a desk? Flying a desk. Does the prospect of flying a desk sadden you? Very much. Fighter pilots come and go, but Three Squadron has been around for two world wars. If there ever is a third, they say they'll be ready. We are the first line of defence, so someone attacking Australia, I would blast them out of the sky. 